I'm, go I'm going to give you a, a, a quick run through of the history up to what we're doing, basically the, 19, the 20th century, the 1900s uh, history of Market Square. Uh, Franz Schultz reminds me that I'm going to say, disruptors will not be tolerated. Um, <laughs> Um, so we're going to run through this quickly, but this is a history of the preservation and adaptive reuse related to Market Square. It's not a history entirely of Market Square. It's about adaptive reuse and preservation of the 100-year-old structure. So this is what it looked like when it opened. Uh, next, please. And this is how it, was, it looked when it was revered first in the, er, in the early 80s. This is by Alice Moulton Ely, one of our former presidents of the Preservation Foundation. Um, when it was the publicity for the um, book that came out in 1984 by um, Susan Dart that sort of got people really excited about the history of Market Square. Next. This, okay, there's two parts of this that I'm going to talk about. First is the sort of arts and crafts um, era, waste not, want not. I saw in the yesterday's Wall Street Journal, they asked somebody what was their favorite thing in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Well, this is my favorite thing. This is a plate by, I can't pronounce the guy's name, but Tom, Tom will correct me, Tom. P-U-G-I-N. Um, Pugin. Pugin, right. Um, it's in the in Victoria and Albert, but it's waste not, want not. Some of us may have heard this in our youth. I don't know, possibly. Um, and this is one part. They used, they always used things. They didn't throw things out. They didn't, you know, just uh, throw them out or forget about them. They used them. This is the early 1900s Penn Station, but in 1963, there was, they were going to tear it down, and there was a big movement that was unsuccessful to save Penn Station, but it was unsuccessful, but it really launched the preservation movement in New York, that was, and Philip Johnson was involved in that. Franz knows about that. Uh, in Chicago, a few months later, they started restoring the Hull House Museum, the old Hull Mansion, um, and putting that together. So very quickly, Chicago was picking up on this whole preservation thing. So we're going to talk now, I'm going to go back to the beginning and talk a little bit about the, just how it evolved. The first side of Market Square, David Mattoon will correct me if I say something wrong. Um, it won't be disruptive. Um, <laughs> this is the station, which opened in 1900 uh, on the uh, east side of the tracks, and there's a train shed over on the other side also, 1900. The tracks in front of the North Shore Line. The architect, Charles Frost, also did Navy Pier, 1916. Alfred Granger was very closely worked with Howard Van Doren Shaw, and he was the one who was really the stylist for that building with its brick and half timber. Let's go back to that slide. Can you go back? You can see it's half timber above and brick below. So that was, this is kind of a little bit part of the template for Market Square. First side, 1900. These are the customers the, um, and the, the patrons, the movers and shakers. This is an 1890s picture of the Wednesday Club members just as some of them uh, gathered together. And they were, the estate people that came out from Chicago were not so happy being in the sort of rundown station that they had at that time. So they moved that aside, but they didn't tear it down. They didn't burn it down. They moved it and turned it into a Presbyterian <coughs> Sunday school on Forest Avenue, just north of City Hall. Uh, this is what it looked like. It was an 1880s, 70s station, David, which, um, right. Correct, yeah. <laughs> Good. But they just moved the whole thing over there and used it for that. As late as the mid-century, it was still there on the site, but it was now a police garage. It was pretty ramshackle after World War II, and then finally got torn down. But the car in front is sort of a late, or a mid, early 1946, 47 car, so we know it's maybe lasted into the 50s. So this shows us the, the context. There's the station on the right. You can see the train shed with a little bit of a warming house on the uh, other side of the tracks, on the left side of the tracks. They had the kind of person up above who was watching for signals there. And then you see the building where Walgreens is now, which was built in 1903, the Anderson block. Um, but beyond it, it's kind of a vague, ramshackly kind of street there. And this is what it looked like from the north looking down toward it. Um, this was a new building, 1904, on the right. The Griffith block, which was again half timber. And we, I'm pretty sure Alfred Granger and Charles Frost did that building too. But you can see there's a little bit of unevenness in the other buildings after that. They'd been built after a fire in 1880 and various just different levels of stuff. And this is earlier, there'd been an old post office there. A little, you know, almost like houses they look like, some of the old stores. Some of them were houses kind of back from the street. This was a Spidell 
illuminating oils. They used them for gas lights, you know, before you could pump gas in. American Express, we've heard of that. I don't think they had plastic yet. Uh, this was behind. It was worse. Be the worst of most obnoxious problem was behind those. There was a livery stable. And so what you had was a certain je ne sais quoi that wafted with the west wind toward the station. <laughs> and when people got off in their fancy clothes to go to the fancy and Wednesday club, they had to kind of fight their way through this odor. There were also these little buzzing things, you know, that come out of the, out of the uh, livery stable. So they wanted that out of there fast. Okay, Howard Van Doren Shaw was the architect, one of the promoters of doing this. We know of him as an architect, but he was also a planner. Planned the, the West Park neighborhood, 1907, for instance, example. That was his plan. And he got going really quickly. They bought the land in 1912, all in one week. They bought all the land in 1912. And they started working on um, plans. This is a 1912 first plan called Town Market. Look at the tower. It's kind of short, right? See how the tower is shorter? Here it had a short park. The park, this was the main building up here. This is the arcades as they are on both sides that we know. And then there was just a little narrow park kind of where the fountain is and that was all there was. And everything behind it was all just kind of apartment buildings and nobody wanted to be there. And it, it, it wasn't going to rent out. You had to make your money out of it, uh, your investment. There was no tax deductions because there was no income tax in 1912. Um, can you imagine? <laughs> Here's the plan they worked out that would have enough rent. It increased the Western Avenue front footage by 300%. This comes from an uh, architectural historian, Richard Longstreth, and it pushed that main building from here, where it was originally in that plan, up to there. And all these other stores could all be seen from the train station. So the park had only elm trees in it, grass, and a few tulips were allowed to come up in the spring. Otherwise, it was nothing obscuring the windows. Notice how the tower went up. Because there were more distances involved, this is about a story higher, the tower in the final drawings that were done in 1915. Now we're going to go on to this waste not want not business. This is where it comes in. Okay, this store was one of the stores on the south part of the east side. The buildings were first built on the west. And then they moved, when they started to do the stuff on Western Avenue, they moved the businesses into the, the stores that had already been built on the west. And then they, then they get ready to move these. Only buildings that really got moved here were the ones south of the south building, behind there. Um, and so this is one of the buildings that's moved. Uh, this is how they did it. This was a big thing in Chicago, was famous for this. David's found an article about, from London about how interested they are in Chicago that moved everything all the time. This is probably the back of the Anderson's original store from the 1860s being moved. See, that poor horse was going around uh, they'd probably have some animal rights issues today, <laughs> but um, he was moving that. This is the, this is the moved, uh, relocated 1862 First Presbyterian Church building right here that was turned into a commercial building uh, in trade. They didn't tear down the first church when they built the one in 1887. They moved that over there. So this was, moving stuff around was, was how stuff happened. This is what it looks like now. That was the building. But it was the heating plant for the whole complex. All the buildings, the north and the south and the west buildings were all heated from here. Now this is on the south side of the building. So naturally the apartments above, which were wonderful, the stores were down below and there were apartments above for the shopkeepers. The people on the south were always hot and the people on the north were always cold because where does the wind come from? Right. So um, th there's piles of correspondence with the renters to the managers, the Griffith Company, about what are you going to do about the heat? It's too hot, it's too cold. Now we know this, the left bank, and that's where uh, uh, Miss Bennett has her place there. That was the Spidell building, which had been around the other way. It says 1894 up there, and there's a building next to it, uh, but we don't have a slide of that, but it's where the resale shop is. Okay, this man is very important. He's, um, nobody probably knows about him, but this is James O. Hayworth. Um, senior. He was uh, a big contractor in Chicago, built high rises. There's a Hayworth building in Chicago. And um, he was the, the man that was the contractor for the project. His job was to keep Howard Van Shore on target, focused. He was a detail man, Shaw, and he would have, it, it, watch over every detail. So there's one place in the, in the actual papers where he's written, where Hayworth has written something out as directions to settle it 
for Shaw. He pinned it to the, to the documents and so they could move on and keep going with the discussion. So he was a very important guy we haven't heard much about. Okay, um, this shows the, where the bookstore was until just recently. Early on it was French's uh, drugstore and it had little bay windows in front of it. Um, by 19, th these buildings were occupied 1916 by early 1917, by April or so of 1917. Um, but after World War II, which uh, World War I, which happened very quickly, and by the mid-20s and all, people were itchy because they wanted to modernize their store look a little bit. So these were, became surplus. They always had um, Shaw's successor. Shaw died in 26, so Ralph Millman took over his practice, and he took these windows out. Now, waste not, want not. Let's look at the next slide. Here's Millman's house built in 1930. <laughs> look at those windows. They came out of Market Square. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nothing wrong with that. Okay, so here you can see this is where they, they, they had these, where they had, the, the signs were bigger and bigger. This is a 1980s shot along there, but you can see the big signs that were up above. Um, and this was the trend. Uh, Lake Forest has always been kind of sign averse, as you know, at least since the 20s. Uh, and, they, and I think that helped hold, held, hold things back. But it was, uh, people thought this was a little bit get, getting a little tacky by the 80s. The little park in the middle was just bare. By 1940, Ralph Millman's wife, Helen Millman, Helen Brown Millman, who studied as landscape architect, trained at the University of Illinois, redid the park. She put hedges along the road because there was more traffic by then. She put p two paths in close by and then a place for park benches. That's when that's first introduced in, in the early 40s, right before World War II. War two. Okay, so now we get into the, the, the preservation movement that really is, gets started in the 60s and 70s. Okay, here, this is Alice's picture in this idealized market square. It looks lovely. Notice all the elm trees that are there. That's probably not entirely honest because I think the Dutch elm tree disease had, uh, had a bad impact. It was starting to drop like flies in the park, but there were still some there, enough to give that impression. Now, this is, this is very important. This is what changed Market Square in, about 19, from the, in the early 80s. PCs hit. People no longer had to go downtown to be in connection with other people. They didn't have to meet personally. They could get one of these things, put it in an apartment upstairs. They could kick out those renters that always were complaining about the heat and just put guys up there in the daytime, punching keys, and uh, they would get more money for it. So the Lake Forest Improvement Trust that had started out to have the, the square in 1912 um, and organized themselves, I think, in 1913. Um, they sold at this point when, they could, when you could get a whole new kind of use out of that upstairs. Now, this is the preservation era. This is a young guy. He's working in the Auditorium Theater, 1966-67. That is John Vinci, the architect. Any people here were at our Christmas uh, holiday celebration in December? He built that building we were in for that, for that occasion. He, didn't, he doesn't look quite like that today, but um, <laughs> he, uh, you can see he was a very hands-on preservationist working on uh, Sullivan's uh, ornament for the, um, for the auditorium theater in the 60s. That was an early preservation project. Now this, the photograph, what, this is a little segue here. The photograph is, is taken by Richard Nickel. That photograph we just saw in color, Richard Nickel. Richard Nickel was a uh, a martyr of the preservation movement. He died in 1972 in the Stock Exchange building. Okay, Louis Sullivan Stock Exchange was built in 1893-94. Um, there was a wonderful trading room where he did the interior design for this. It had been covered up already by 1908 and the people had moved farther south, closer to where the markets are now. Um, but um, it was still protected up above these uh, uh, false ceilings. So that's the Stock Exchange, 1893-94, uh, when it was built by, by Sullivan. It's getting torn down in 1972. They pulled all this out. The Art Institute said they would save this, and they would reinstall it in their new building. They were building it on the east side of the Art Institute, um, the kind of modern buildings over there. So that was what they did. But just unable to not go back a last time to see if there was some ornament they'd missed was Richard Nickel. He disappeared in there in April of 1972. They didn't find him, but way down, weeks later, they found him in the basement, second basement down below. Everything had fallen on top of him. And so he, he um, and there, John Vinci and others are, are today still working on trying to um, 
uh, published his photographs because he was a wonderful photographer. There he is uh, when he was doing that. Uh, another pose looks a little bit more mature. That's what he looks like there. This comes to Lake Forest, 1976. This is a not too good picture, I think, of uh, Paul Sprague, who worked with the City of Lake Forest Historical Society. He was a Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin professor of architecture to do the first initial pass over um, the east side of Lake Forest, including the train station and Market Square for the National Register Historic District process. And so 1975 to 77, I think it was approved in 77, but the, in, the, the document was done in 75 um, with, his in, with all of his uh, analysis and all, uh, that went in in this same period. Next slide, I mean four years after the other. So 1976, the Preservation Foundation is founded. Edward Bennett Jr. was the first uh, president of the organization. Uh, and here's that stock exchange, 1977. This is dedicated and opened in the Art Institute um, in the West Side. It's, it's, it, they, they took everything they had, then they had, did more work to um, replicate it and uh, reproduce the parts that were missing. Uh, and it's still a fantastic room. It's little understood. 40 years old, like the organization. Anything that's 40 years old is sort of old fashioned. 50 years old is historic, right? <laughs> 40 years old is old fa fashioned. So when we, my wife Janet and I were at the Art Institute and we were behind some people and we'd just been to that room and some, some people asked, what's that big room they asked the guard? And she said, oh, it's just a room. <laughs> so it depends on your point of view, but I think it's one of the best things at the Art Institute. Uh, really remarkable uh, for its period and, uh, that it, and for two periods, when it was originally created and when it was done as a restoration and in, in part honoring uh, the memory of Richard Nichols. Uh, that's John Vinci as he's looked more recently, um, and he's still very much part of the scene and an architect, but he was the one chosen to do the restoration work by the new owners, the Mearses for Broadacre Management in 1983-84, and got those signs off of the building, that sort of thing. Uh, we saw this with the issues of the signage above. If you look today, oh no, this, oh, and another thing is that M Michael uh, Ebner Helped, this is a book that he did in 1988, nationally uh, kind of helped broadcast the idea of Market Square to the country, to the architectural historian community, uh, urban historians. Um, that was 1988. He's a Lake Forest College professor, emeritus like me. And um, he was, um, that book was published by the University of Chicago Press, has a lot about Market Square. It's a major feature in there. If you haven't seen the book, it's worth getting a hold of it. So this is what it looked after a project that was done in 2000. But if you look, I've just put it up here mostly for the, see above where those signs were? It goes back to the original 1916, 17 transom-like windows uh, above, not the big blaring signs in all different kinds of styles. Now, where did the bricks come from? They, they were sidewalks originally made out of concrete. Um, concrete and asphalt was the basic motif uh, of that until the late 90s. And of course, we also know you can also find that at Walmart and um, Target and every place else. So this was going to go upscale. They wanted to because the stores already were starting to lose people because they didn't have to be. They weren't prisoners of their desktop computers. They had laptops. What do we have now? We can have our whole office can be on here. You know, people don't need an office. Um, so they wanted to make more use of those stores, the mirrors, uh, the Broadacre people, and so they. Um, worked with the city and worked with the Lake Forest Garden Club to, to both rehabilitate that, do the inf infrastructure underneath, make it more garden-like, and put in a little bit more, how can I say it, upscale, high-end feel with having the brick paths rather than the, the um, normal cement paths. Uh, this is Rodney Robinson. He was the Delaware landscape architect that did that part of the plan, uh, worked on the, on the land. What we see now in Market Square pretty much is what his landscape idea was. He was hired by the Lake Forest Garden Club. And there was a pr process called Market Square 2000, a project very much like the Forest Park project that just was completed last year. Now this picture came in 1999 because Shirley Paddock, who is second from the left, um, talked to Gordon Lackey, who she'd gone to school with, um, I was a Lake Forest College graduate, and Gordon was in charge of Griffith, Grant, and Lackey. They had a basement underneath their store that they'd been in since 1916, John Griffith's firm, um, and nobody went in this basement. It had a, in a hallway, there was just this little trap door, 
and the secretaries drew straws to see who would have to go down <laughs> at, before Christmas and then after Christmas to get out the ornaments. Nobody went down there. So Shirley got to, to go down in there, and we found in within 15 minutes of going down there all the papers for the, the creation of Market Square, the building uh, committee notes and everything that had to do with all that, and the plans. We found the town market plans, which Michael Ebner had, Michael Ebner had actually read a reference to the town market 1912 plan, um, but no one had seen the plans, and that's where we found them. Um, so the two other women, uh, in the middle is Prue Beidler, current uh, alder person here, and with Chris Cherry, Chrissy Cherry on the right, they were the co-chairs of Market Square 2000 that raised the money. And what was funny was we found the papers, all the letters to all the people saying, you're supposed to give money to make this thing happen. And then people would write back in 1917, 16, 15. They'd say, uh, I can't afford to give you that much money for this investment. And they'd say, yes, you can. We know you can. So <laughs> <laughs> please send the money. <laughs> uh, and they, they were laughing just like that because that's what they were doing in, 19, in two, 1999, 2000 to people. They were writing to almost the grandsons and granddaughters of the, that original group saying, we're going to fix this up. We'd like you to contribute X. And they'd write back and say, oh, it's been a bad year. I can't do X. And they'd write back and say, yeah, you're going to do X. So here we are today. This is kind of what Market Square looks like or has looked like very recently. Um, and the, the main building way back, you can see how different it would have been if it had been up front with a big park there that's uh, made that a really large, generous space. So that's Market Square in the, uh, the preservation and adaptive reuse of Market Square in the 20th century. Okay, <laughs> next. <laughs> so I don't know what was, what's more intimidating, honestly, it's, is it following Howard Van Dornshaw's masterpiece or is it following Art's presentation on Market Square? Um, I, I feel like I should have, we should all get some college credit for, uh, for that. It's, it's very informative. I, sh I should have a picture of Michael Schreiber up here because um, like the people who came before Michael and OKW, um, there's a hundred years of, of stories and leaders that created Market Square. Michael Schreiber, if you don't know, Michael's a Lake Forest native, um, a resident, and a local businessman. And about three years ago, Michael came to us. He was a client of ours. Michael came to us. Um, he's officed in the Marshall Fields building. And let us know that he was uh, in the process of purchasing Market Square. And, uh, and would we be interested more? He wanted us to, to be his architects to move forward. Well, professionally, that was a pretty simple question to ask pretty quickly. I mean, we're chomping at the bit um, to be able to participate in, in being really stewards of, of Market Square. Michael, thought, Michael felt that this is kind of a legacy project, um, growing up in town, living in town, raising his family here, um, and that he really wanted to kind of pass on something, um, kind of the continuation of Market Square. Professionally, and, and some of our um, team members are here today, as, as well as uh, we've got, got a whole team back at the office who's not here today, but um, professionally, we were really excited about this um, because we're, we're able to touch a masterpiece and, and listen to stories both verbally and the ones that you kind of find when you work on preservation, um, when you start digging into things and hearing those stories and hearing stories of people from Lake Forest, hearing the, the residents um, and the architects and the developers of this. So that was exciting from a professional standpoint. In addition to, we know Market Square, we're students as well as professionals of architecture. These are things that we studied in college. Um, I didn't realize that until I went away to college, kind of how well known, how famous, how important, um, and how groundbreaking Market Square was is really the first planned retail development in the country, arguably that. So we understood the historic importance and the architectural and planning importance of this. And then as Allison mentioned, personally, growing up in town here, this was really a part of my history, shopping at, at Forest Bootery and the other stores in town in Helanders, um, that I could, it was really kind of humbling being able to participate in the kind of the legacy of, of Market Square. 
um, not only for you and for residents of Lake Forest past, um, but also for my own family. My uncle owned a shop next to Kittles. It was a bar, uh, my Uncle Barry, uh, in Market Square. My, my father was instrumental in the redo of the fountain back in the late 70s. And so um, it's, it's a very uh, kind of humbling opportunity experience uh, that we could, we could look at professionally as well as personally. Um, and, and really got to make sure I don't screw it up, or we <laughs> screw it up. Um, <laughs> Because uh, there's, there's not many more important things than this. So Michael Schreiber got us started on this about three years ago. Um, 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 thanks. <laughs> and, uh, and shared with us his vision for Market Square for the next 100 years. Um, and it was really kind of a twofold um, uh, ideas. One is there's a lot to restore and preserve. It's a 100-year-old building with 100-year-old or close to it infrastructure. And there was a lot of work that needed to be done that <coughs> deferred maintenance. See, there's stuff that had been touched lightly in the 80s with, uh, with John Vinci or stuff that had not been touched for 100 years. Um, it, included, um, it included looking at accessibility. As, as we all know, the second floor space at Market Square is not accessible for those of us who need it. Um, those stairs getting up are a little precarious, to say the least. Um, as well as other life safety issues. The building's not sprinklered. Um, and then there were elements of just looking at, taking hard looks at the facade and the roof and kind of the, and the bones of the building. It's a 100-year-old building. Um, if, if you have a 100-year-old house, um, you understand these things very well. Beyond that, though, beyond or in addition to the restoration preservation component, um, Michael and our team had a vision of, of kind of the next steps for Market Square. And this is kind of the really the additional fun stuff that we can show you today. Um, as Art noted, it's, uh, it's a rehab and an adaptive reuse. The kind of the beauty of Market Square is it's not a museum piece that we put under glass and tuck away and just look at. It's something that we live in, we shop in, we work in. Um, it's a living museum piece. And like any living museum piece, be it a city or a building, um, for it to live, it is best if it evolves and adapts. And just as the second floor apartments, originally designed as apartments, adapted to an office use, how can Market Square continue to adapt um, and continue to live? But most importantly, be very respectful of its history, of the stories that, that, we, all, that we all have, not only for the past and, and the present, but those future stories that are going to be told by, by um, folks generations from now. And really try to expand the Market Square experience. When we talk in the office about Market Square, and I think in town too, are we talking about the square? Yes, we're talking about the Village Green. Are we talking about the buildings that front that, that create the square? Yes, Market Square is also the building. Market Square has a broad connotation. It's, it's place, it's building, it's experience, it's, it's kind of what we just kind of feel. And, and the experience of Market Square has expanded over the years. When John Vinci and, and, um, the, and Broadacre expanded behind South Market Square to create that really great courtyard. That was an alley when it was initially constructed. That arcade that cuts through there is not original. Um, they had a great, bold idea, but it looks original. I remember the first time I went through there, I had to do a double take. I don't, I don't know if I remember this. Um, and it was done very, um, very respectfully of the square. And so how can we expand the Market Square experience looking at the North Court and beyond whether it's that experience up and down Bank Lane or Western or west of the Marshall Fields building, the old rec center, um, and even the public parking to that. These are kind of bigger picture ideas that we're starting um, to investigate. Um, and I'm going to share with you uh, kind of later on about what we're planning for the North Court. <clears throat> so when we started looking at this 
three years ago, we already had a lot of photos of Market Square because we had studied it for some of our other projects. But it gave us an opportunity to really dive into looking at the facil at, at really the facilities, the infrastructure, the buildings, the spaces in between the buildings. Um, and what looked like just a, you know, it, was, it looked great. Hey, it's in great shape. But really, when you started to look at it, boy, there were a lot of things that really needed um, attention, some more immediately than others. And so we had to prioritize um, those components. And we were able to, really blessed, to be able to get into pieces of Market Square that, that most of us have never seen or, or don't see or don't see from this perspective. Um, I, I've yet to be, be one of those lucky people, but some of, some of the others in our office were able to get up into the towers. Um, the image in the bottom left is looking up at the ceiling of the, of the, clock, or the sundial tower on the north side um, and kind of see the, the craft and even level of detail in places you'll never see. Um, the image on the left is a view of the clock tower peeking out from one of those little windows up there. The image on the right is the mechanism that runs that clock, or runs the three faces of the clock. Um, and throughout the, the space up, up there in that tower, on the south tower, workers over 100 years, workers who have worked on that clock, have written on the wood. And this is a piece from 1931. Again, the stories of Market Square well before, well before our time. We wanted to be able to respect that and honor that. Um, I will attest to, as will my wife and kids, we have not removed this and put it in our house, like the bay windows uh, before, nor will we. Um, we're, we're not looking at opportunities to pilfer things from here, um, although that was a clever idea. Um, let's go on to the next one. And so some of the documents that we looked at, uh, that we started to create to talk about really this first phase, first phase being restore, preserve, um, let's keep the water out because the roof is leaking. And so we were focusing on, on really the facades that front the square. That was kind of phase one. And then over time we would look at other pieces. And be it down on the street level or up on the scaffold, we really looked at kind of the, um, the level of disrepair and age that a lot of these elements um, we're showing from, from water and ice, the, the fascia of the south tower actually popping up and water getting in there. You, you certainly understand what the scaffold was like. About We even wanted to make sure that the scaffold looked halfway decent, so we found those old blueprints and had them printed on, um, on the piece so that people, again, had a, an understanding of the history of this. Up in some of the gables, which have this beautiful scrolling woodwork, there are these elements that hang from the middle. They're called bosses, um, made out of wood. They're actually three-dimensional hearts. They're four-sided hearts that have a little heart carved out in the middle of them, and some of them were in really bad shape. The cupola on top of the old rec center, Northgate building, um, was really in need of, of, some, of some TLC. And so these photos and, and some others that we looked at really started to tell the story of what do we got to touch? The 100-year-old slate roof that was chipping and, and years of goop just to try to keep the water out. The bricks that were deteriorating and the mortar and the stucco that was deteriorating, as stucco often does. Gutters and downspouts that were creating um, a beautiful ice skating rink out in front of our stores, <laughs> um, but not the safest thing in the world. So these were the things we needed to really address first, which we did. Um, and at the tune of a, of a good chunk of change, the first thing was to address the slate roof and the gutters and the downspouts. So what the, the pile here on the left is the old slate, um, the 100-year-old slate. And, and I admit today I'm kicking myself we didn't save that stuff because what an awesome present that would have been for everybody in town. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe there will be other opportunities to find some of this stuff. And on the right was the new slate, matching. We, we looked to see how we could match the inherent qualities of the original slate. So the color, the size, the thickness um, was all very, uh, very akin to what was done originally. We looked to make sure any brick that needs to be replaced was matching exactly. 
Um, and so a lot of studies of that, even down to the mortar, 100-year-old mortar, you can't, it's, you, you can't actually um, replicate that type of mortar because some of the materials that went into that mortar 100 years ago aren't, aren't the same as today. But, so we try to do it with today's materials and match even the mortar and getting samples right up there. Really tedious, um, painstaking, gloving work to do. Um, and the kind of the final image of the, of the beautiful slate with the copper gutters and downspouts and the new copper cap to the cupola that sits atop the old rec center building, the Northgate building. Um, looking at the stucco and paint was really fascinating. It was this kind of forensic science that, that we were getting into. Um, the stucco up in this image on the, on the left, and the upper portion of this was the current day stucco. We actually scraped those layers of paint to get down to the original stucco to find that it really wasn't painted, that the color was integral, was integral into, the, into the plaster. So we wanted to make sure we tried to match that, which is actually lighter than what we saw three, four years ago. These beautiful plaster scrolls um, that were in the stucco, if they could not be salvaged, we made molds so that we could replicate them and get that level of kind of human detail that goes into this beautiful build, these beautiful assembly of buildings. And then scraping layers of paint um, away, trying to get down to those original layers of paint. Art showed a slide of the Griffin block, which actually predates Van Dorenshaw's 1916 Market Square, which is where Einstein's is, or Scotty's Restaurant, if you remember that from the 70s. Um, this is an image of scraping away the layers of that and trying to find out what the original <coughs> colors were. Um, and lo and behold, we were able to find that. Many people kind of wonder, what did you do to Market Square after the scaffold came down? Maybe it looks a little bit cleaner. Is there anything really different? Oh, the gutters are shiny and the downspouts. Um, the color, the paint, is, is actually quite different when you really get into it. The image here on the right are the paint colors that were what it was three years ago. And <laughs> I think we all really remember kind of that teal blue, that teal green um, that was painted, I believe, in the 80s. It, that color may have come actually from Van Dornshaw's Ragdale, the house on Green Bay Road. But as we scraped layers of paint away, we found out that it's not the original color. The original color is actually a little bit more of a forest green, and the colors of, um, of the brown trim or the stucco were really a little bit different. And so the work that we've done in the restoration is to go back 100 years and match those colors. So what you see today, let's see the next slide, what you see today, it's no different and it's very different perhaps than what you saw three years ago. And it's crisper, of course, um, but the green that you see is actually goes back to 100 years ago. That's that bay window on the Griffith block that we saw a couple slides ago. Um, and getting back to the original colors and, and replastering it. Um, and so this is what we see today, and we're gonna to continue to move forward um, on this. We're gonna to continue to move forward from a restoration preservation standpoint. I think some of you are starting to see this um, with what was the old wine and cheese on Western Avenue where Starbucks <laughs> is gonna go. That's all, under, that, that's all been released, hasn't we know? I didn't give anything away, did I? We try to keep our clients' secrets, you know, under wraps. But yeah, Starbucks is moving in there. I guess I just revealed that. Um, and so we're going back to the, we're looking at the original storefront. As Art showed that those transom windows that were above the big display windows with a prismatic glass. Um, sometimes we find underneath those big ugly sign bands that were added over the years, the original prismatic glass. What that glass did is actually refracted light more into the space, which was spectacular. Um, and when they've been damaged or removed, we're able to try to match those as best as possible and to replace it um, so that we can get back to what it originally was. There, the base of many of the storefronts has been covered up over time. In many of the storefronts, the original base is, again, prismatic glass because those were actually windows into the basement. Um, and some of the stores right behind the glass is an is a elevated display. Well, that's elevated, 
uh, because there's kind of a little clear story window or a high window that lets light into the basement um, of the space. The basement is just storage, but perhaps they were thinking down the line, who knows what'll happen to that space. And so we're going back and trying to match that, and I think Starbucks is a great example. As new tenants move, as tenants move around, as things happen, um, storefronts will start to get uh, replaced back to its original. Again, we have no intent of stealing the bay windows. They're there, they're gonna stay there. And then the North Court, uh, which is an alley right now. What did we learn from the South Court? How can we expand that Market Square experience and provide additional outdoor public space um, for Market Square? And that's what we're really diving into today. Um, this is an image from the sky of some of the things that we're looking at doing, and I'm gonna go a little bit more in detail. But just to orient you, the towers obviously are great orienting elements. Um, the bank property to the north, there's a great little courtyard back there and some parking to serve the bank, and bank lane, and, um, and kind of the, what I remember as Helanders off to there. So what are we doing to that courtyard area? Well, as I went back, we talked about accessibility. The second floor has no accessibility. So how do we get accessibility up there? It's with an elevator, an elevator, another fire stair. Working with the Historic Preservation Commission Council, um, we looked at a number of options and a great spot to put it is a centrally located spot um, behind, I think it's Sweet Pete now, um, kind of tucked into that corner. Um, what else is that courtyard, is start to enclose it um, give it a sense of courtyard um, type feeling uh, like the South Courtyard. It's a very different space though because the South Courtyard is completely um, created by buildings. There's buildings on all sides of it and there's a couple points of entry, one off Bank Lane and one off the square through that new little arcade. The North Court is very open because of the parking lot and the court of the bank. So how do we create a little bit of a sense of enclosure? So in addition to that, that elevator stair for accessibility, how do we get there? We're proposing to cut through another arcade behind Forest Bootery, relocate a stair so that we can have direct access from, the, uh, from Market Square, from the Village Green, into that courtyard. Um, and then over time, a lot of these unsafe stairs from the front and from the back that serve that second floor space are going to be filled in from the, the stairs on the front, from the front, they won't look any different. There'll be a door, it might be a door now that leads into a, into a retail space, but it'll look no different. And from the back, they'll be enclosed, I'll show you how, but they'll be enclosed in a manner that looks like it was original. Um, and then we'll be inserting some new stairs. Go to the next image. And then on the second floor, the, the elevator stair would be right here in this knuckle. On the second floor, this is just a concept. It does open up the ability, if there are multiple tenants, to have a common corridor that perhaps goes down the center, or maybe it's on one end to be able to access multiple tenants, um, but to be able to have that accessibility on the second floor. So how do we get to something new? Because this is the humbling, daunting, exciting, intimidating phase um, when it's beyond restoration. It's new stuff. It's new stuff to um, a treasure, uh, and, and, and so, we do so with great care. Again, we're students of architecture. We study the heck out of things, like what's the existing space? What do we need to touch? Uh, what do we need to improve upon? This is the image of that North Court off, um, off uh, Bank Lane. So that's an access point. Um, this is an image from the bank's parking lot. There's utilities flying around everywhere. Well, how can we enhance the experience and deal with the utilities? Um, and, and with the dumpster in place, what's great about being back there is you're far, you can get far enough back, you can have this connection to one of the icons, to the tower, from a different perspective than you get from inside the square. We also study what was done in the South Courtyard, which is a beautiful space, um, creating this gateway arch, entering it, pavers, opening up the back of storefront of stores that were just serviced before. Um, with glass and French doors and the opportunity to spill out into that space. We also study the surroundings, 
study the heck out of the buildings that comprise Market Square. But, but beyond that, even the old theater on Deer Path, some of the new, relatively speaking, the new architecture that expanded that experience of Market Square and looking at, at details of that. Um, and what can the feel of that new courtyard take on? And an English walled garden kept coming back to us all as being a really appropriate um, feel for that space, how architecture and landscaping can coexist um, harmoniously to create an environment. Um, with the Botanic Gardens having one of the greatest examples of an English walled garden, um, right virtually in our back, back door. Um, and then we also looked at the at City Hall because whenever you're adding on to a historic building, you can kind of go in one of two, one of two ways. And, and they could be both very valid ways. One could be, this is a, this is a new element and it should speak of the current time. Um, and it should be reflective of that. And that's, a, and you can do that and be very deferential to the existing context. Another very valid philosophy when you add on to an old building is to basically make it look like it's, it was part of the original. Um, or if it wasn't, it was done shortly thereafter. Um, and it still may look fresh and new and perhaps a little bit different than the original, but have a feel that um, it was always there, and so maybe 20, 30, 50 years from now, we might not be able to tell when things were done. And City Hall, the addition that David Woodhouse did on the west side was of that philosophy. Um, and so we felt that that would be the appropriate philosophy for, for Market Square. Let's see if we can go on the next one. And we studied the heck out of Howard Van Dornshaw and his contemporaries, his English contemporaries to get a sense of architectural elements. Rather than just repeating something that's on Market Square, we want, and, and in some ways, repeating it might be lessening um, the, the pieces of Market Square. Are there things that Van Dornshaw and his contemporaries 100 years ago were doing that would be appropriate for Market Square? Um, whether it's Ragdale, and specifically the back of Ragdale. This is, the courtyard's the back of the, of the main facade. Um, so we looked at the back of Ragdale, how did he treat that less formal space, as well as some other homes. This one I walked by practically every day um, in our old neighborhood in Evanston. Um, and then other architects in England, Charles Vose, Edwin Lutchens, um, really studying the heck out of this. Um, my buddy Kyle's here, and, uh, and, I, and I say this to you, Kyle, because your buddy Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, if any of you remember Led Zeppelin. Jimmy Page, this is his house in England. Um, he lives in a Lutchen's house. And then of course we studied, we were able to access the blueprints, the 100 year old blueprints, which are really precious. Um, and so kind of creating a synthesis, this is the fun stuff we've come up with and started to work with the HPC on. Create a gateway into, the, this is one point of entry. We create a gateway into that into that North Square. We should have had the before picture, the current picture, um, to kind of compare. But create an archway, and it's not a copy of the archway Vinci did on the South Court, but it's a derivation of that. It's, it maintains the idea of brick piers and this beautiful wrought iron, but the scrolling work of the wrought iron is very Howard Van Dornshaw-esque as we, as we studied his work. Even the light fixture that will hang from there is a light fixture based upon some of his designs. Um, or not, not Van Dornschwab, but in this case, Edwin Lutchens. Why Lutchens? Again, he was a contemporary of Van Dornschwab. Um, and Van Dornschwab did travel to England, likely met or at least saw some of Lutchens' work in that English arts and crafts kind of Tudor era. I felt that that was really appropriate. Um, at the end of, of the alley portion, you see an element, this, this tower element, this Tudor looking tower. That's the new stair elevator lobby that provides access to the second floor, kind of drawing your eye through the space. So now you're not looking at just the backside of some building, you're looking at some focal point. And then between there, over time, we'd like to be able to open up 
those walls with more storefront. Spaces could spill out into the courtyard. If you have a food user, might be able to get bistro tables back there and be able to design or be able to dine back in there. There's an existing wall that already creates an edge to the garden. Landscape and expand that wall in that area. <clears throat> Again, getting, getting closer to that, seeing the, uh, the, the storefronts. Um, repairing, replacing the windows up on the second floor, the old apartment windows as necessary. If you recall, there are these kind of open stairwalls, balconies. Over time as necessary, fill them in, but push the glass way back so it's still very reminiscent of what was an old balcony. Get um, flower boxes up there, that new stair elevator element, the expansion of the garden wall, picking up some of the detail, the wrought iron, so that functionally we still have to have access in and out of that parking lot. What's interesting about this space, and maybe you've experienced it at the South Court, it's still a functioning alley. There's trucks that go up and down that every now and then, perhaps really early in the morning or so. But it still has to function for, as a service alley, just in a different way. We're not pulling trash out of here, um, but vehicles still need to get in and out of here from time to time. An image from that parking lot. I think the one thing you'll see gone is the, is the pole that had all the electrical equipment and transfer coming in here. Um, Michael Schreiber was adamant about, we gotta get rid of that thing. <laughs> um, and it's not getting rid of the electricity because we still have to power this thing. And so we're gonna be consolidating it in one piece. It's actually tucked behind, tucked behind this car, it's actually tucked behind the wall and the wrought iron. And so functionally, it's still is serving the square and visually it just kind of goes away. Um, and so that, that really works great. Um, another component of this that we're looking at is as this space starts to get used more frequently, you know, think of, Mar think of of um, like Forest Day and the art show and other elements, we're providing a public toilet back there so that if you can't get into the stores, <laughs> thank you. That's my legacy, being, being the son of a plumber is to provide a toilet. <laughs> so, um, and, and so there's important functions to that too. Um, but pick up some elements that are familiar with Market Square. This, this bay window, technically called an Oreo window. So you, if, you, if you don't know what one is, you learned that today. It's an Oreo window. A bay window that, is, that does not come down to the ground is an Oreo window. And so providing this little window that's actually on the landing of the second floor stair. So you can look out over, the, over this beautiful landscaped courtyard. Or if you're in the lobby on the first or second floor waiting for the elevator, you can look out in the courtyard. So there's, there's elements like that that kind of touch our heartstrings. There's also practical and security issues that you don't feel like you're kind of tucked away where you know, someone could lurch around is that it's very visible, it's very open, and I think you're gonna, people will feel safe in that space as well. And the architecture's reminiscent, but it's not a copy of anything. It doesn't compete with the tower, but it helps provide a little bit of anchor to that part of the court. Um, in addition to this, um, this, you're looking back at the, the, what I'll call the back side or the south side of the bank building. We extend that garden wall separating the court from the parking uh, with brick that's gonna match the market square, we'll call the market square brick, and some wrought iron. There's that transformer tucked behind there. Has practicalities of needing to be serviced, but it's visually out of the way. Perhaps a little water feature to provide some sound back there as well, landscape. We wanted an open space. There was a lot of discussion on how open or closed should the space be. Do we have landscape in it or not? The thought is to keep it open so it's flexible. Anchoring the north end of that court is this little pavilion. Keep in mind the pavilions at the Botanic Garden that I had a picture of. One you can occupy and one is a service pavilion actually. That this element can open up and become kind of a market. Um, much like Amade has, has this great little store wedged between those two buildings. Um, 
how wonderful to repurpose a space and adapt to today. What a wonderful opportunity to repurpose the North Court, not just as a place to walk or to sit, but that it could really be activated with fruit and vegetable market or something like that. Um, and so we, we look at those opportunities and make sure that it's done in a expression that's very sympathetic to Market Square and, and its surroundings. <clears throat> and then a view looking back, we've removed the big dumpster um, that was in the previous spot, kind of looking back at that courtyard space. And over time, the back side of these buildings, that front western, will be addressing those. Um, short term, it might, might just be getting some paint and cleaning it up, but long term, it might be refacing it um, or other things. It's, it's down the road. The other, um, the other thing that I really love about this image, see the, the dressed up portion of the back alley, the new garden wall, this element, it's that connection, it's that connection to the square. Mm -hmm. We've, we're expanding that experience and we're making it accessible to everybody, either drop-offs right there by Vootery or drop-offs over on Bake Lane. Um, some of the things that we're gonna be looking at down the road are awnings and signage. Boy, there's, I don't know how many different types of awnings and signage that are out there. Some very um, appropriate and some so not. Uh, and so we're working with the Historic Preservation Council Commission on, on, um, on creating, helping create updated guidelines to what already exists. Um, looking at the awnings, looking at signage. These are actually original signs. I think you're familiar with the Jolly Good Fellow sign. They did a great job of making it contextual with the original sign. We're gonna build off that. So perhaps in the arcade where Forest Bootery has their sign kind of mounted to the brick, do we come up with a similarly um, detailed, kind of that human touch detailed signage? It's new, um, but it'll feel like it was all part of the original design. So we're working through that with the HPC this spring and summer. And perhaps other opportunities for signage. Um, the city, around the city, we have, uh, we have some. Certainly you see it in many communities. Our blade signs so that when you're walking tight to the storefront, you're not trying to do this. If, like who's, who's there now or who's the shop there that you have blade signs? Um, that are respectful of the context. Um, this is not existing. These are, these are photorealistic images. Or, so the, the opportunities of adding some blade signs that are very in keeping with, with what currently is there. So that's some of the stuff that's coming down the pike. When we started this a few years ago, we had an idea what we were getting involved in and really excited about it. Um, I can tell you, um, never in, in kind of our wildest dreams did we think we were going to be commissioned with designing the city sticker. <laughs> the city sticker. So Michael, was, Michael Schreiber was contacted uh, by someone in the city. Michael, it's the 100th anniversary of Market Square. Yes, we all know that. Um, we'd like you to design the city sticker. I was like, okay, he calls us. He's like, guys, get your marketing department on this. Um, and so our marketing staff started taking a, a shot at the city sticker. And if you haven't already bought it, this is what it's gonna look like. Just a little bit smaller. Um, and we, we thought the appropriate thing is let's dive into the old drawings, because a lot of people haven't had the benefit of seeing the original the original drawings, and these are, these are prints of, of Van Dornshaw's 100-year-old drawings um, as a way to celebrate um, the history of, of this. Um, and, so, and so my sister will make sure that when it's time to peel off the city sticker at the end of the year, I get a copy of that one. <laughs> um, so that's, that's a fun little thing if you didn't, if we, that we wanted to unveil. We had the opportunity of that. Again, kind of going back to that image of, of this, this new space that we're creating, the expansion of Market Square, um, with elements that are new, and element, but elements that are very familiar. Um, and so that the stories that we all can share, um, we can share those with our ancestors, and then people down the road will have 
there are stories to talk about the space, um, the whole space, the whole Market Square space, and perhaps new fun things that might happen in some of this new stuff. I think that's it. That's it. Fair.